self-identical history. And I made a couple of statements such as that is not intelligible. And Barbara has done some very nice work in a couple of sections. And uh, I prefer not to go into it because I'd like her to do it. She's done the homework, some very fine work. So next week, I hope she'll be up and coming. She's got the flu. But um, just go to 28 for a moment. At about just 28A, so I'll read that paragraph up to the point I'm interested in. Now, first of all, we must, in my judgment, make the following distinction. What is that which is existent always and has no becoming? What is it? That which is becoming always and never is existent. Now here's the sentence. Now the, now the one of these is apprehensible by noose thought, noose, with the aid of reasoning, logos. Okay? So just take a look at that. Existent always. Right. Has no becoming. Now, one of these, which is this, is apprehensible by noose. Right. And we're going to call noose the eye of the soul. Some people translate that with the word intellect. With the aid of reasoning. Now, I'm putting in logos instead of reasoning. Now first, now, first of all, we must, in my judgment, make the following distinction. This is the first distinction between these two things, that which is always existent. Now, this word, existent, always existent, <coughs> takes on many, many terms, always existent. Often, other translations, we use being, capital B. Being always. Now, but I thought since we don't have too much to do today, that why don't we just look at how he uses that term in just one other place so that we can see the power behind this one term. And um, it's an old favorite of mine, and I think it might help us. So let's look to the section called 50A. Wow. Uh -huh. 
something curious is going on in this paragraph. Um, that he talks about things, he uses the word such-like. But I'd rather right now get into this paragraph. But we must bestir ourselves to explain this matter again, yet more clearly. Now imagine that a man were to model all possible figures out of gold, and were then to proceed without cessation to remodel each of these into every other. Then if someone were to point to one of the figures and ask what it is, by far the safest answer in point of truth would be that it's gold. But as far, but, but as for the, the triangle and all the other figures which were formed in it, one would never describe them as being, seeing that they change even while one is mentioning them. Rather, one would be content if the figure admits of even the title such like being applied to it with any safety. And of the substance which receives all bodies, the same account must be given. Let me do it again, right? And of the substance which receives all of these bodies, the same account must be given. It must be called always by the same name. For from its own proper qualities, it never departs at all. For while it is always receiving all things, nowhere and in no wise does it uh, assume any shape similar to any of the things that enter into it. what's laid down by nature as a molding stuff for everything, being moved and, and marked by the entering figures, and because of them it appears different at different times. And the figures that enter and depart are copies of, the, of those that are always existent, being stamped from them in a, in a fashion marvelous and hard to describe, which we shall describe rather for Therefore, he's talking about three things, right? And it's real fun what he does with them. Uh, for the present, then, we must conceive three kinds. Becoming, wherein it becomes, and the source, right? Goes into this great notion of uh, place as well. Okay, now, if you hold on to that, um, <clears throat> and I'm now at uh, 51D. <clears throat> Excuse me, 52A, but I like 51D as well. Um, okay. I'm now on 52A. It starts really at uh, 51D. This then is the view for which I, for my part, cast my vote. If noose, right, intellect, whatever we're going to call it, if noose and, and true opinion are two distinct kinds, right? 
touch this. If uh, nous and uh, true opinion are two distinct kinds, most certainly these self-subsisting forms do exist. Hey. Ah. Curious word. They're both forms or ideas, capital I. If nukes and true opinion are two distinct kinds, most certainly these self subsisting forms do exist. They're self subsisting. <coughs> perceptible by our senses and objects of reason only. That's what they are, objects of reason only. Whereas if, as it appears to some, a true opinion differs not and not at all from reason, this is he's rejecting this. Whereas if it appears to some that true opinions differ in no way from news, then on the contrary, all the things which we perceive with our bodily senses must be judged to be most stable. Now these two kinds must be declared to be two, not the same, because they have come into existence separately. They're unlike in condition. For the one of them arises by teaching. Oh, there's how it arises. arises by teaching. The other, of course, by persuasion. And the one is always in company with true logos, right? Ah, this is always in company with true logos. Always with true logos. Nukes is always with true logos. Hmm. Not interesting. Whereas the other is irrational. And the one is immovable. You can't move it by persuasion. Whereas the other is alterable by persuasion. And of the one we must assert that every man partakes, but reason, huh, or logos, only the gods in a small class of men. This being so, we must agree that one kind, here's the word now, is the self-identical form. Now watch the words that go with it. Ungenerated, indestructible, hey, neither receiving into itself any other from any quarter, nor itself passing into uh, into another, invisible. Hey, it's, it's, uh, in all ways, it's not perceptible by sense. It's an object which is in the providence of reason to contemplate. Oh, oh, you got to use noose to contemplate it. Oh, there's an object for contemplation. Ah.
noxious to contemplation. Second kind is that which is named after the former and similar hereto, uh, an object perceptible by sense, generated, ever carried about, becoming in a place, and out of it again perishing, apprehensible by opinion, with the aid of sensation, and there's a third kind called place. Now the idea of place is really important, but I want to drop it. Okay? Now, we're still looking at this one word. Now, um, ungenerated. Right there, it is. Right. Indestructible. Now, try to picture these negatives now. <coughs> this is the curious part. It doesn't receive into itself any, uh, any other from any quarter, nor itself passing into any other. Another. So it doesn't receive anything into itself, and it doesn't enter into anything else. Huh. <coughs> it doesn't receive any form. The whole idea now, we want to see.
I'm, he I'm wondering whether I should uh, give you one more quote. If you were going to contemplate something, and this is his description of a proper object of contemplation, can you do it? Like, what would it take to do it? And what is it? Hmm. Something right, that's uh, ungenerated, it's indestructible, self-identical, it's always the same, is the word same. Uh, existent always. I have to apprehend it. I have to get it by this noose or I'll put in what many people use for that, intellect. But um, very few people get it. Uh, but it arises by some kind of teaching. And you can only get it by teaching. Well, it's always the companies with true logos. Now, a lot of times they use the word for logos, reasoning. But that's such a poor word because obviously uh, reasoning is not the kind of activity that is confined to a small class of men. So. And to say that the gods reason, then you're wondering what kind of thing they're doing, if they're doing it. So therefore, we'll use this word because it's in the translation for the moment, but um, I, I prefer that word because it doesn't have those connotations with it. Now, uh, Let's do it, all right? And would you agree we need a volunteer? Would anybody oh. object if we call on Virginia to do it? It's a dem democracy, isn't it? Yeah. I, I was going to volunteer. I'd love to do it. Okay. <laughs> Let me add a bit of curiosity to this. I'm at uh, Republic 508D. And in this edition of mine, it's on uh, page 307. I'm curious. Um, saying I want you to understand something is I'm uh, trying to figure out the 
relationship between the good and the idea of the good or the most brilliant light of being and so and so. Understand that. That is the same with the soul. When it settles itself firmly in that region, right. settles itself here. In this region. Firmly. In which truth and real being rightly shine. It understands and knows. Huh? Then it understands and knows. Yes. And appears to have reason appears to have reason. Appears to have it, see, appears to have reason. But when it, when it has nothing to rest on but that which is mingled with darkness and that which becomes and perishes, then it opines, grows dim sighted, changing opinions up and down. It's like something without reason. It doesn't have it. It participates in it. It doesn't have it. Right? Now the whole republic is an exploration of true logos. And this, this, this brightly shining being, truth and real being, once the soul settles in it, then you know what? It understands, it knows it, and appears to have reason. News. Interesting? Now look over here, see? Um, if this is what he's talking about, Right? But he's still talking about the same subject. Then there's a certain kind of, of use of the mind that follows from this experience. And what we were starting with and looking at what the time is, is that the word, the word that they use to try to describe this kind of intellectual activity is phrenesis. And uh, I do have a good quote for that, just to get that one more quote. Uh,
Now this is where the room is being created and this is where time comes in. It's a key place because um, in, in the, <clears throat> the basic, you know, the basic problem of all metaphysics is that uh, basically it's this one. ID in the mind of God, right? Uh, the intelligible. Right? Uh, ID in the mind of God. The model for all creation or the paradigm. Now, this idea, of course, should be used with a capital I, is eternal. Eternal and this eternal, I dislike the word forms, by the way. Um, so I'll use capital I, eternal ideas where we don't mean the word idea as a concept, right? But we'll call them archetypal. No, that's not even good. Because it's not. But, okay. Better to say the idea in the mind of God. A paradigm. All right, now, God focuses on this. A matter of fact, in the time is and what we're dealing with, he fixes his mind on this. <clears throat> it's an ongoing activity and out comes the, the copy or the cosmos. Now here's the problem. The problem is this is eternal. This is in time. This is eternal ideas. This is around the time. Perishable things. All perishable things. Now, you could say, well, you know, God has got many virtues, but he may not be a good artist. Because when he's using that eternal model, he's creating a bunch of things that change and there's a big difference between eternal models and temporal things that change. Agree? It's a mess. Okay. So, therefore, in the time is, he has a sharp division. Remember, it's not just the cosmos. It's the cosmos and the all. So, one part of it of what he creates is eternal. The other part is temporal. Ah, see. He has to create a mean between these. Some device, and that is time. Right? Because time is a moving image of the eternal. This is the eternal. Therefore, the entire process, the, the entire unfoldment, <coughs> thank you, of creation, is nothing other than manifesting everything that's in this idea Right, on two levels, eternal and in time. Once time is created, 
then the manifestation now changes and now we can introduce things that emerge and go through all kinds of processes. So what? He says, he created us, right? Us, we are a species that shares in both. Because the soul is eternal, and therefore we're part of the intelligible part of the universe that he creates in a world of nature which is all temporal passing to and from as it is. And um, the problem is time. So think, well, what is it? What is that? How is it time? And the, uh, that's the first. Second problem. Um, In general, in general, is there always a difference between the model and the copy, no matter how well it's done? Yep. <laughs> so, one more stuff. Um, so, no matter how well it's done, there's always a difference between what is used in the creation what is used in the creation and the part that doesn't is not going to be in creation since you agreed there's a part that's always not involved in the process of creation that follows from any given model therefore the part which is used for creation is a paradigm or put it this way okay the intelligible or being itself is the source from which that <coughs> paradigm is the model from which creation is created. Therefore, there's a difference between these two. And there's a difference between the paradigm and the cosmos, because they can never fully articulate every feature in the model, or you'd be creating the same thing twice and there wouldn't be a copy, it'd be the same thing as the model. Okay, so that's the second big one. Third big one is the one we're in, which is, how the heck is this and we can put this in with it. Does he have a yoga? Does he have a yoga? Does he have some way where the soul can encounter that in the time is? Then it's not just a, a cosmology. It's also built into it a kind of yoga. Look what he's saying now. Look her. See? If it is, if you can apprehend this, if you can apprehend this, what is existence always, that's being, that's being. It always exists. It's also going to be saying, be said to be the same, always the same. Well, how do you do it? What do you need? And how do you get it? Well, it looks like you don't have it. You got to get it. Oh, here. It arises by teaching. But teaching presupposes some kind of stuff that a teacher is going to use to teach. Right? Therefore, the teaching right, is always accompanied by the true logos. 
And now, that terrible word, Phoenicians. Now, there are 20 places, there could be more, and Barbara has a complete list, but there are 20 key places where the idea of phrenesis is being used in the, in the time of this. And Barbara has a whole big, and she was going to talk about it tonight, but uh, she's not here, and I have the material, she'll talk about it next week. But um, from my, I have several good quotes. Is phrenesis, now what do we mean by phrenesis? Forget the Greek word, all right? Is there a way of using the cognitive processes that we have? Is it possible that there's another way of using the mind? And if so, does it fit within the structure? What would be the test of it? Well, <clears throat> that's easy. You should be able to do it or don't. But at least you should understand what to do, whether you do it or not. You should still nonetheless be able to understand it. Right? So, um, of course, you know the two quotes I, always, I often go to, uh, which is at uh, uh, 70 and 90, 72, I think. And, um, okay, I just want to hit these key quotes to show you the depth of where we're going. The gift of divination, which is at uh, 71E. word, okay, gift of divination, right? Divination means the activity of, of being divine, right? The action, the activity of being divine, right? The gift of divination. You see, um, if a person in this state of mind, seeing truth and real being, letting the soul abide in it, resting there, if that's then opens him, him to both understand and know it, and gains this curious activity, that's a gift of divination. It's not his, he's given it. He gets it, shares in it. it can, therefore, it can be called the gift of divination. So then, would divination be the same as phronesis? That's where we're going. The same as the activity of the That's why you're going to read it for us. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay? Okay. Uh, 71E, do you have it in Thomas? Yeah, I do. Hold it. Let's everybody. Get I have it. Thomas. Thomas, you have it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's such, such a beautiful and long quote. Uh, I'm embarrassed to have to chop it up. So, uh, ah, how do we go for the whole paragraph? Okay, then we'll pull out some parts of it. Okay, good. Well, go slow. However, on the top of the page. Oh, okay, great. However. However, as the divinity perceived that this part 
would not be obedient to reason, but that it would naturally reject its authority in consequence of every sensible impression, and would be animastically hurried away by images and phantasms both by day and night, considering this. He constituted the form of the litter and placed it in the habitation of this desiderative part, composing it dense and smooth, splendid and sweet, and at the same time mingled with bitterness. That the power of cogitations descending from intellect into the liver as into a mirror, receiving various resemblances and exhibiting images to the view, might at one time terrify this irrational nature by employing a kindred part of bitterness and introducing dreadful threats, so that the whole liver being gradually mingled might present bilious colors, and becoming contracted might be rendered throughout wrinkled and rough, and that, besides this, it might influence its load, ventricle and gates, in such a manner that by distorting and twisting some of these from their proper disposition and obstructing and shedding in others, it might be the cause of damages and pains. Okay, now he shifts the positive side. And again, that at another time a certain inspiration of gentleness from the dianoetic power. Right, from the understanding power, dianoia, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. By describing contrary phantasms and affording rest to bitterness, through its, through its being, unwilling either to excite or supply itself to a nature contrary to its own. And besides this, by employing the innate sweetness of the liver and rendering all its parts properly disposed, smooth and free, might cause that part of the soul which resides about the liver to become peaceful and happy so that it might even refrain from excess in the mind and employ prophetic energy. Okay, it's where it starts. Okay, go ahead. Since it does not participate of reason and prudence, for those who composed us, calling to mind the mandate of their father, that they would render the mortal race as far as possible the best, so constituted the so constituted the depraved part of our nature that it might become connected with truth, establishing in this part a prophetic knowledge of future events. But that divinity assigned divination to human madness may be sufficiently inferred from hence, that no one while endued with intellect becomes connected with the divine and true prophecy. But this alone takes place either when the power of prudence is bettered by sleep, or suffers some mutation through disease, or a certain enthusiastic energy. It being, in this case, the employment of prudence to understand what was asserted either sleeping or waking by prophetic and enthusiastic nature. And so, to distinguish all the fantastic appearances as to be able to explain what and to whom anything of future, past, or present good is portended. But it is by no means the office of that which abides and is still about to abide in this enthusiastic energy, to judge of itself either concerning the appearances or vociferations. Okay, it's a very difficult uh, sentence. And, uh, okay. Let's look at it. But that divinity assigned divination, right, the power of reaching the divine, to human madness. Right? Madness, uh, four kinds of madness, and it was called divine madness, may be sufficiently inferred from hence that no one, while in, in uh, due to intellect, becomes connected with the divine and true prophecy. But this alone takes place either when the power of prudence is fettered by sleep or suffers some mutation through disease or a certain enthusiastic energy. It being, in this case, the employment of prudence. Prudence, of course, is pernicious. Right? 
it being in this case the employment of phrenesis to understand what was asserted, either sleeping or waking by a prophetic and enthusiastic nature. And so, to distinguish all the fantastic appearances, as to be able to explain what and to whom anything of, of future, past, and present good is portended. That's the whole sentence. What is he telling you to do? Not to do something and to do something else? It's, but in, in being, in this case, the employment of phronesis, prudence, to understand what was asserted either in sleeping or, or waking by a prophetic and enthusiastic nature, so as to distinguish all fantastic appearances, to be able to explain why and to whom anything of the future, past and present is good. That is, portends good. The lobe, look, that belongs to a man when in his right mind to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dream or in waking vision by the divining and inspired nature and all the visionary forms that were seen, either by means of reasoning to discern about them all wherein they are significant, and for whom they portend either evil or good in the future has a present. So it belongs to a man when he's in his uh, right phrenesis, right? through news, to recollect and ponder both the things spoken in dreams and waking visions by the divining and inspired nature. Hmm. So if this if this book is any good, right, if this book is any good, if there is this thing called prudence, if you need it to understand, see it's an intellectual function. So we don't use the word prudence in English anymore. Right? But that's the word that they translate for phrenosis. Um, If you need that for understanding, then for this book to be of any interest, it looks like that's an essential part for divining, divination. And it looks like, again, you have to use these words again together. So. Is it possible, therefore, that the dialogue gives plenty of good examples of this word, so now we can use it for the first time? Because in this quote, it looks very important, does it not? It's a tool by which you can then learn how to understand dreams and be able to talk about the present, past, and future for anyone to whom and to what is concerned. It's a certain kind of faculty, some kind of faculty of the mind. So if he, if he claims that this is the case for this curious faculty of the mind, and if it's a way to gain divination, and if divination is a way, therefore, to reach the divine, and if the divine is nothing other than this, what is existent always, then it should arise by teaching it should arise, therefore, in the dialogue the time is. 
institution. And therefore, we have to follow this word, right? Logos, what offhand is called reasoning. Because it should then awaken, awaken this curious faculty. Huh. So, when the lobe translates this, this key word, same, right, as self-identical, this, this causes a lot of problems. Because there's no idea of self throughout here. There's no idea of self, as we call self. <coughs> so Barbara's going to give us a talk and say what this really is talking about is that which is the same, identically the same. Oh. Well, then he has to tell us, since we're part of the cosmos, no, no, we're part of the intelligible cosmos. We're in both worlds, nature and what's intelligible. I guess what he's saying is you ought to be able to wake up your mind and hmm. first you have to suspend what they call prudence. Yeah. You have to suspend it in sleep. Yeah. And then you reapply the prudence to what you got, the divination you received in your yeah. dream. Let's yeah. see. And we need to know more about this curious word prudence since nobody uses it that way. I mean, the last time I was at a pub and I asked the guy, you know, Spencer for, Prudence. For beer prudently, uh, I didn't get it. Yeah. Right, so. It is a very curious term. And so, yes, go ahead. one, two. No, go you went first. No, you were right. You were so quarter. we did a dream with Nabuya. Pardon me. We did a dream with Nabuya. I think you're right. And that gave us. And he was given a gift. And you in, have to talk about what you mean when you say he was given a gift. Uh, well, in this, he was given a dream, or yeah, the gift. Yeah, it came in, a, as I understand this, that uh, in his dream, in, yeah, in his sleep or when he was distraught, but in his sleep, he was give, he had a dream. So I'm taking that to mean that he was, um, as it says here, achieves true and inspired divination. He wasn't in his rational mind. He was in sleep. Watch. So, in his pondering... You say, you say he wasn't in his rational mind. Well, in Why the... You say certain cognitive functions were suspended so something right. could come in. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, in pondering then, having him bring it here and reflect on it and... Uh, discover its meaning that would be as I understand it the activity of phronesis well you see um, with only two quotes and by the way the section we're in uh, 28, 29, 30 the idea of phronesis appears several times key places as okay. we've already left out uh, but I'm, the reason I'm not answering it okay. is because we have to see it being used again and again. Okay. And how these terms, because he's really talking about something rather important, the gift of divination or a process or a yoga to get into that kind of an insight into the nature of the cosmos, at the same time getting an insight into hmm. the intelligible or the paradigm or being itself or that which is the same. Yeah, I, I wanted to add to his his statement about there's there's two stages in that road to divination you were talking about, and uh, the first is uh, like at seventy one e. 
called it, everybody? In 71E at the end of the paragraph? Yes. Seeing that in reason and intelligence it has no share, so it, it literally it doesn't participate in logos or phronesis. Mm -hmm. And again it's repeated, man's foolishness, God gave unto man's foolishness the gift of divination. Foolishness is a lack of phronesis, or not aphrosune, so not engaging in phronetic activities. So again, this gift is given first when there's no phronesis. It's like something That's you true. can, it's something that um, <coughs> one participates in and out of. Yes. And it's when one is not participating yes. in it that the gift enters, That's or right. could enter, That's right. and then you have to participate of it in order to grasp what was given you when you didn't have it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we're going. No. Now, uh, I really just thought we'd only take about 10, 15 minutes on this. It looks like we ran over time. So uh, <laughs> let, let me give you a couple of, couple of quotes. Okay. You, right. Um, in the ion, I've always understood that. Uh, Go ahead. Pardon me, ladder? In the ion. Is that one of dialogues? Yes. Okay. I've, I've always concluded that it's uh, uh, divine. How is this different from um, divine inspiration in the ion? Well. Or does it? It's your choice of terms. Um, you have to know who's talking. Ion claims to be, Ion claims to have the power of divination. And it turns out to be a bogus claim. The, the reason but I'm asking hold it just one moment. There are several places in the dialogue that do give an example of divination. And one is Theoclymenos, the quote out of the uh, Odyssey. No, no, no. Out of the area. No. So, go ahead. Well, Not from Ion, the figure Ion, right. but Socrates quotes Theophanes as an example of pure divination. Okay. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is because I've always understood. What? what? I've always concluded that uh, out of the Ion, divine inspiration is, is the negative. Well, this seems to be right, uh, highlighting divination as well, the, the mean to an insight, right? <coughs> well, I've always concluded and thought the conclusion of the ion was that divine inspiration, if you want to say that's divination, is negative. Like that's a thing to uh, that's a thing to steer away from. Yeah, it's the way you're using language. Right? You have to decide uh, what would you say is the state of Ion, not what he claims. Would you say he is in any way divinely inspired? <coughs> Not what he claims, because he does claim divine if inspiration. Recall, if I can recall it, he's uh, out of his mind, and uh, he's in a frenzy. That, 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 that description would be the poet, not, not Ion. But go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I don't recall the Ion so clearly, but I don't know. I don't know Ion's descriptions. Did you? Did I lose your question, or did you lose your question? Well, here it seems like divination is a, a positive. I think your point, let me see if I express your point. It looks like you're saying after reading the ion, I think there's a rejection of divine inspiration. Right. 
Yes, in the ion, there is a rejection of ion claiming that he's divinely inspired. Not, not divine inspiration. Right. Okay. Because he does give clear examples of divination, does he not? And the example I just used. Right. The seer, who can, before the event, can describe what happens when all the suitors are being slain and their souls are hurrying to hell and gone, right, in great clouds and bursts of, of sulfur and all kinds of terrible deeds happening right in front of him. He's describing it as if it's taking place immediately in front of him as a participant. That's the Right? Great quote. And I got caught up in, in uh, using my memory and, and uh, that link to it. But, uh, but can, I, I can I ask a question, uh, Brad? If yeah, hold on, just, just, just let me, while he's hot on this tail, and I have always fun reading this quote. Um, yeah, and the ion, Socrates. Look here, then. If you were asking the question, and if you should say, ah, well, Socrates, so much for these arts, you find places in Homer where each of these ought to decide, but kindly find something about a seer and his divination, which are the bits which he ought to be able to decide and to say whether they're done well or badly. If you were to say that, see how easily and truly I shall answer. He speaks of these in many passages, the Odyssey. For example, that seer of Mel Melampus' family says to the wooers, Theoclymenos, I mean, poor souls, what mischief's on you. Night is wrapped about your heads and faces, down to your feet. There's a blaze of wailing, cheeks bedabbled. The porch is full, the hall is full of specters hurrying to hell in darkness, and the sun put out of heaven. A foul mist covers all. He's there, he's seen. Soul hurrying to hell. That's divination. Mm -hmm. Seeing it before it takes place, as if it's taking place in front of him. And seeing not only the physical event, but the realm of the soul and where they're going, all in one vision. That's in the eye. So I don't think he's dumping. Um, going back to Tadeus in 28 a. Yes, please. When he, uh, I, um, have the Thomas, but it's Stephanus 28a. Oh, oh, yes, that's a great when he's, when, when he's describing the apprehension of the real being, he says that the former of these indeed is apprehended by, by intelligence, oasis, in conjunction with reason, logos. But isn't that Phronesis itself that he's describing? Start from the beginning of the In the first place? Yes. In the first place, mm -hmm. therefore, as it appears to me, it is necessary to define what that what that is, which is always real being, but is without generation. And what that is, which is generated indeed or consists in a state of becoming to be, but which never really is. The former, real being, of these indeed is apprehended by intelligence in conjunction with reason. That's in, uh, intellect and logos. Now, if you want a nice quote for Phrenesis,
There's one at 29A. Page. Yes, that's true. true. Please read it. Um. But it is clear to everyone that his gaze was on the eternal. For the cosmos is the fairest and the most beautiful of all that has come into existence, and he the best of all the causes. So having in this wise come into existence, it has been constructed after the pattern of that which is apprehensible by um, Logos and Phronesis, and yeah. is the same. I'm also the good old Tata Tata. Mm -hmm. um, yes, do you have that one? Yeah. Do you want me to read it in Taylor? Um, j just, can you read the concluding sentence of the paragraph you were in, please? So having in this wise come into existence, it has been constructed after the pattern of that which is apprehensible by reason and thought and is self-identical. What's the conclusion to your paragraph that started with? Yeah. The one that you had. It's a couple, it's a long paragraph, is it not? What's exactly at 29B for you? But to describe its origin according to nature is the greatest of all undertakings. Uh, is there a new paragraph that starts at 29B, sir? No, not in my book. Try reading two sentences before what you just read. Oh, there it is. Are you referring to that, the line that reads, for the world is the most beautiful of generated nature, and its artifacts are the best of causes? And the one right after that. Uh, but being thus generated, it was fabricated according On the top of page 431, do you see the very top of 431? Yeah. But being thus generated from the bottom of page 430? Yeah. It is fabricated according to that which is in which, which is comprehensible by reason and intelligence, yeah. and, and which subsists in an abiding sameness of being. So my question is, is that, is that apprehension of reason, or that apprehension um, by reason and intelligence, is that for an ASIS? That's it. See, it's, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I think that it would be an interesting difference. So having this wise come into existence has been constructed after the pattern which is apprehensible by Logos, right? Um, and Phronesis. And is uh, same in itself.
you go to exactly line 30 in your text, this principle which we shall be wholly right in accepting from men of Phronesis as being above all the supreme originating principle. So this whole thing is from men of Phronesis. So let's see what they've got and let's see if we can pull it together. So now self-identical is same. Right? Same. Same. Idea of same is going to run through the entire world. Now we want to see whether or not whether or not he can make clear one, two, three, Phronesis four, how it plays a role of divination, and finally in dreams and pull together so that we can see it unfold. What? The providence of God. Why? Because the providence of God is divination, the activity of divination. A good coming down from the supreme all the way down into the affairs of mankind. <coughs> and that's what he's going to be doing. If phrenesis is connected with divination, dreams, providence, that's where we're going. Okay, we quit? No, you had quotes. Oh, I have a whole bunch of them. Uh, <coughs> the ones I like are 31A4. Especially in Thomas Taylor, 36E, um, 37B4, All of these quotes, all of these references are to this one idea, self-identical or same. And I have them in my book, but there are about 20 references. I'll put them on a piece of paper. I'll get them through the web and get Barbara to pass them on. But the ones that I like are... Uh, See, what is the what is the way we're working? We're working on this assumption always, which is that if you're interested in understanding an idea in Plato or any author, collect all of the occurrences of them, get them all, and see whether there's something that can link them all together. And especially some are going to be much more rich than others, and so you get into those and let the others. We construct so you end up with a kind of a jewel piece, you know, like they only have three major ones and around it are secondary ones. It takes on that kind of form. Um, this is something I was wondering about. Uh, oh, hold on. Let me, uh, Pierre, Pierre, Pierre. Let me take a snapshot real quick. Okay. Okay. 
you going to erase that? No. Turn it around. This mean a knowledge unit. Uh, we know the four forms that it uh, takes, right? We're familiar with that, right? One wanted to say, can you talk about Plato's dialogue, the symposium, in terms of these three people? If they arranged in a mean analogy, would you agree you should be able to say, well, uh, I can describe how Diotima relates in what she says to Socrates and what Socrates says to Diotima. I can also explore how Socrates relates to Agathon and how Agathon relates to Socrates. Well, this is a teacher and this is a student. So therefore, in that, we can then go back and compare how, the, how they are as teachers, how they are as students, Hmm. We can then uh, see what it took for Socrates to move from a student to a teacher. So, look here. Uh, we can make this comparison one, two, three, four, right? Make a study five and six. And if we unpack those, would we be doing the resetting them in terms of this? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you know that any any terms are related in a mean analogy, you know you can make all of these comparisons and then spell them out. And that's the uh, thing I just want to make sure we, I didn't say that last time. And, uh, We can then see to what degree she's positive over Socrates, whether she does more than Socrates. Or equally well, we can compare the two students when they were students. And then we can also talk about why there is no relationship between these two. And the dialogue. So I just want to read that. Ah, get something to drink. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I only expected to take 15 minutes. On that. Are you taking a picture of that? Yeah. Good.